Shall we pray? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Um, I know many of you were expecting Lynn to be preaching uh, this morning, as indeed was announced. Uh, I was, in fact, expecting Lynn to be uh, preaching this morning, but uh, as, as Scott has, has mentioned, um, we have a granddaughter, Savannah Grace, um, who decided to arrive nine days early. And so uh, Lynn headed off up to uh, Canada on Thursday. Um, before she went, she had in fact written her sermon for today and said that I was welcome to it. Um, however, you, you may have noticed uh, with our gospel reading from Mark, it's about gardens and seeds and birds of the air. And in our family, Lynn is the gardener and her sermon was full of illustrations and stories of her gardening. And I felt it would be rather dishonest simply to pass those off as mine. So I've made considerable emendations. But I will highlight one part which is originally hers. Uh, you may remember um, last week, um, in the previous reading from Mark, uh, we heard how Jesus' sanity was being questioned by religious teachers around and also by his own family. And they were outside calling him to come out of the house, stop teaching and come and join them. Um, which is always good for us to remember that, you know, Jesus was not welcomed everywhere and understood and admired everywhere. Even his own family members thought he was probably insane. And certainly other people did. Uh, but Jesus did not go outside and said that if his words were too hard for some, then he would talk to those he called his family who came inside and listened. So often the understanding of Jesus was that, that he was mad or at least strange. And part of that was not just that he was a moral teacher, but he proclaimed himself to be the son of God, the word of God. And the man who says that is speaking the truth or is insane. There aren't many other options. For us, this could make more sense because we now live on this side of the resurrection and we can look back. And that gives a different understanding to these words. Uh, but the disciples at the time knew nothing of that. All they had was this sort of rather strange and often very puzzling preacher talking in parables. So often it was not clear to them even after the resurrection, as we know, they could still be fearful and often they didn't understand, just as we often do not understand. Jesus spoke in parables. Mark says at this time, he spoke only in parables. And many of them can be confusing and some remain so. So he had to take his disciples aside afterwards privately and explain to them uh, what he was talking about. And sometimes they still didn't know. It seems like the two parables we mentioned today are fairly straightforward. The part of a series of parables which Jesus is talking about seeds. Remember the most famous one of the man who scattered his seeds, some fell on stony ground, some fell on dry ground, some sprang up and was choked on weeds, and some fell on rich soil and grew and spread. But Jesus now tells two more parables about seeds. And again says, this will tell you what the kingdom of God is like. And he says, as has just been read, the kingdom of God is as if someone scatters seed on the ground. Life goes on, waking, sleeping, but the seed is slowly growing. And the person who sowed the seed doesn't know how. And he said, the earth produces of itself, that is, by itself. As I mentioned, my wife is the gardener, um, but I do bring her tea as she gardens later on in the day, white wine. And 
I do what she is, I, I observe what she is doing. And know that the miraculous and mysterious things can happen even in the most humble garden. From a tiny, tiny seed, something beautiful grows. She plants and waters. But it's while she and I sleep that something happens beneath the soil hidden from view. And we cannot make that happen. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like this. It's like something that will grow even without us. And of course, often despite us. And Jesus not only talks about a seed growing of its own within the earth. Um, we don't understand it. He singles out one particular seed, the mustard seed, the smallest of seeds, yet when it grows, it becomes the greatest of shrubs, and the trees live in there. The, many of the church fathers commenting on these, these parables comment on the fact not just a, that a mustard seed is small and grows to be very large and so is like the kingdom of God, but something about the mustard seed itself. At first, it has little to offer, but crush the seed, and I quote, the pungent savor of its fruit will make our mouths burn, as you know, if you've had a mouthful of mustard. And they thought, too, that this was also an image of Christ, that as he was bruised and crushed, he released a power and birthed the church throughout the world. And again, this church grows in ways we don't know how. There was never a sort of golden age of the church. Some ages are better than others. Uh, but there wasn't a time when, you know, all was wonderful and everything we, as the church throughout the centuries did, was right. Um, let me just take two examples from, from high points in church history. Um, as you might remember, for a lot of its first 300 years, the Christian church was persecuted in the Roman Empire. It was usually declared illegal and an affront to the emperor. In the year 315, the emperor Constantine made Christianity legal, licit. You could now be a Christian without fear of persecution from the empire in 315. In the year 380, the emperor Theodosius declared that Christianity was the religion of the Roman Empire and all Romans must follow it. This is quite a quick shift from being persecuted to being free to becoming the persecutor all in the space of 65 years. So uh, even in that time of freedom for the church, things could turn quickly. Or at the time of the Reformation, a time um, in which we find many of the origins of the Church of England and now the Episcopal Church here. And many great and wonderful things happened at that point. But it also ushered in wars and destruction throughout Europe. So in our high points, we have our low points. Uh, we, as a church, tend to fail. Rather, it is Jesus Christ who is the reason for growing churches, that God reaches out, God reaches out to us in Jesus Christ. And last week, you may remember, Zeldon was preaching us and he reminded us of families and that we are part of the family of St. James, many of whom, as you know, are off now in the Shenandoah. But it's also good to remember that our family stretches beyond the borders of Virginia or beyond this nation. It is worldwide. And again, we see great suffering and we see great church growth. Uh, we live now in what is probably the largest pattern of church growth worldwide in human history. There's there are more people joining the church now than ever before in the last two millennia. 
just um, one example from this. Um, as many of you will know, there's often speculation as, uh, when will it happen that China's economy becomes larger than that of the United States? When it will become the largest in the world? Uh, could be in a, just a couple of years. We might also speculate, when will it be that the church in China, church in China becomes the largest in the world, surpassing the United States and others? Um, it's hard to pin down exactly, but some people who spend a lifetime studying this uh, think it's going to be about the year 2030. That is, 15 years from now, China will have the sort of largest body of Christians of any country on the face of the earth, surpassing even Mexico and Brazil, which are also likely to be larger than the US then. Indeed, just as one note, the country in the world to which most Christian missionaries go, the largest single grouping of Christian missionaries go, is the United States. We have more missionaries coming into this country than does any other country in the world. Often following immigrants, Korean churches will send Korean pastors over here for, for new congregations, Chinese ones, similar Nigerians and um, others, but it adds up. So we have this large, boisterous and growing family, uh, growing not because of things we have done, but because of the work of Christ often hidden in the earth while we sleep. We also, as with the, the burning of the mustard seed, um, have a church which suffers, uh, particularly now in Iraq, in Syria, and in Libya. But even here, we find remarkable stories. Uh, most of you will know about the killing of the 21 Christians beheaded by ISIS in Libya in, 2000, in, in February of this year. Uh, there were Christians from Egypt, uh, members of what we often call the Coptic Orthodox Church, but its real name is the Church of St. Mark. That was who founded it. That is the Mark who wrote the Gospel we read, and who was himself from uh, Cyrenicia, Libya. So there's a connection there with our Gospel but of these people, they could have saved their lives if they denied their faith. If they had converted, they would not have been killed. Um, all this is available, oh, it's gruesome, all this is available on, on YouTube. But each of them insisted they were Christians and were killed. Uh, it's often said there were 21 Egyptians, actually there were 20. And there was another, a man from Ghana who had been working in, in Libya. Uh, we don't know his previous religious background, whether he was Christian or something else, but he had been lumped together with these Egyptian Christians. And when he was threatened with death and was asked, what did he believe? He said, pointing to the Egyptians, he said, their God is my God. And so he was killed. So uh, these are not just stories of persecution under the Romans um, or in Japan or of medieval conflicts or other things. Um, this is, is February of this year, um, a story to rival anything in our histories. So amazing things are going on in the world and it's the activity of God through Jesus Christ. And as we've read, Jesus spoke in parables. Sometimes they appear clear, like the ones we've read, but then we find they're not so clear. And Jesus is saying, oh, these things happen while you're asleep, and you don't know how they happen. So for the parables, and here I'm actually going to, this is part of Lynn's sermon, which I will take over. We should read the parables and prayerfully ask, several times. What does this parable say to me? What image, what thought, what experience, what hope, what challenge, what joy, what regret 
comes to our mind. As the water ripples when a stone hits the water, we might ask, what disturbs my soul? And then listen, though we may not get an answer. Perhaps there will be a still small voice, perhaps a deafening silence. And then we may go out and water the garden or plant seeds. If we think of the seed, the plant as the living word of Christ, it will flourish in good soil in our own souls. We should encourage that by taking time to read and to pray and to listen. And to ask Christ to weed out those things in our lives that choke and prevent us from growing. As the parable says, the earth will produce of itself and the kingdom of God will grow because of what God does. But we also are called to take the word of God and to live it out, believing despite our own stumbling and hesitant witness. Amen.